Um, good afternoon, um, depending where you're joining us from. I um, hope I'm not standing in between your um, lunch. <laughs> uh, well, so um, thank you very much for attending this online seminar. And um, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Lara Donaldson. Uh, as she has already introduced, uh, I've known her for many years since I was a PhD student at Kaos, I think sometime in 2010, 2011. And uh, yeah, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to uh, talk to you guys about uh, what we have been doing at Winsor Kane University, where I'm currently working. So yeah, um, Lara has already uh, introduced quite a detail about my background. And um, yeah, I grew up in um, Penang. Um, that's a small island located north of Malaysia, very close to the Thai border. Um, it's the most, most beautiful island and has the most amazing street food. Well, at least that's what I think. <laughs> and uh, it's been consistently voted as one of the top destinations for tourism and importantly for retirement. That's my target. <laughs> uh, I studied uh, at um, a private university in Kuala Lumpur for my undergraduate degree. And then uh, we migrated to Canada and I did my master's at Cambridge and before going to Kaos for a PhD where I met Lara. And from there, um, I, stayed a, I stayed a bit at Kaos um, for a short postdoc and then I moved to France um, for another postdoc before joining Wenzhou Key University in China um, in 2016. Right, so uh, at at Winslow Kane, um, there are three research teams in my group, two of which are related to plants, and the other is about um, antimicrobial resistance and probiotics. But today, um, I will be talking about the work we are doing on plants, in particular, plant cell signaling. So, um, as mentioned, Lara and I uh, shared the same boss at Kaos, Chris Gehring, who was interested in discovering um, new signaling proteins in plants uh, using an innovative motif-based approach. Uh, one of which is the identification of um, heme-containing nitric oxide sensing proteins, or also known as HNOX. Um, so we know that nitric oxide um, is a signaling molecule in um, the cardiovascular system and it is responsible for vasodilation. It had an um, interesting link to Alfred Nobel, um, the Swedish chemist who invented dynamite or nitroglycerin, as well as other explosives. So he liked to make, uh, make bombs. Um, he discovered that you know his workers at his factory, ex his workers experienced chest pain or angina on days that they didn't work, say on a Sunday or Saturday. <laughs> so that was quite strange. And then later, uh, it was discovered that you know the workers inhaled inhaled this nitroglycerin and its derivatives, which could be metabolized to release nitric oxide thus helping with the relaxation of the smooth muscles and dilation of the blood vessels, therefore relieving these um, you know, angina symptoms. So uh, today it's now clear that nitric oxide uh, binds at a highly conserved domain known as HNOX in guanalate cyclase, um, enzymes that convert GTP to CGMP. Um, the, you know, the important signaling molecule, second messenger, and the binding of which would then activate the GC guanylate cyclase through a conformational change in its structure that now enable the protein to then convert GDP to release CGMP. As a key um, second messenger, CGMP, well, at least in animals, will have to act through protein kinase G to reduce the cytosolic calcium levels leading to the relaxation of the blood vessel. Now, this um, HNOX uh, domain is um, highly conserved in bacteria all the way to eukaryotes, including animals, but strangely missing in plants. 
So Chris Garing, my former um, boss, my PhD supervisor at that time, was the first to extract the amino acid, uh, the key amino acids, uh, which are highly conserved and have direct ligand binding functions at the H Knox domain. He then constructed a search motif that enabled the identification of um, other H Knox candidates in plants. Like animals, um, nitric oxide also mediates many important biological effects, um, such as the regulation of pollen tube growth and the targeting of the ovule for plant sexual fertilization. Nitric oxide also mediates uh, photomorphogenesis and guard cell movement. Um, so back in 2020, we reported the first nitric oxide sensing h nox protein in the model plant Arabidopsis thaliana. Uh, this is a di diacylglyceryl kinase, and this protein is exclusively expressed in the pollen tube. Um, working on mutant plants lacking this protein, we found that these um, mutant plants had impaired pollen tube growth, and the pollen tubes lost uh, sensitivity to nitric oxide, as um, evidenced by the reduced bending angle when challenged by a nitric oxide point source. So if you look at the slide at the, on the left panel, we challenge this growing um, pollen tube with uh, a, a point source of rapidly re uh, releasing nitric oxide. And when they when this pollen tube um, sends the presence of nitric oxide, it will bend away from uh, nitric oxide. But this uh, this response, this bending angle of uh, the pollen tube was very much reduced in mutant plants lacking this protein. Um, spectral studies also showed that this. Um, protein uh, produce a unique SORET peak that could be reduced and altered by nitric oxide. Um, and, you know, proteins that harbor mutations to the key amino acids in the motif had reduced uh, SORET peaks and um, nitric oxide dependent spectral changes. And we describe our methods um, for the identification of H Nox proteins in a few places, including trans and molecular plant. And uh, at Winslow Kane, we have a very strong computer science program. It's one of the first programs here. So um, at that time, uh, we did not have um, a, a, a major in biology. So I had to work with computer science students, but um, it's good because uh, many, we managed to get some very interested uh, computer science students to uh, create a bioinformatic tool, a, a prediction tool um, to rapidly predict uh, h -Nox proteins. Right, so uh, currently at our lab, uh, we continue to characterize other candidates there are other candidate proteins that might um, bind to nitric oxide, such as this one, OEX1. It's an organelle ex, uh, exonuclease. Um, uh, this part of the work is conducted by these uh, this, this two students, uh, Bi Chu Yun and Zhang Jingwen. And um, currently, we uh, our data suggests that this um, OEX1 has spectral characteristics that were altered when the key amino acids in the motif were substituted. And we are now beginning to explore a plant world by investigating the pollen tube of plants lacking this protein. And our early indication uh, suggested that the pollen tubes of these mutant plants were less responsive to the nitric oxide compared to the wild type CO0. Now, switching on to uh, uh, um, another topic uh, is, is also within plant cell signaling. Our group at uh, Winslow Chain continued the works of uh, my former boss, uh, Chris Garin, to identify the enzymes that generate the second messenger CGMP or CAMP. 
Uh, as we know, the genome of the model plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, was released in the um, year 2000. And it was apparent that some of the key signaling components that we thought were highly conserved in other organisms were somewhat missing uh, in, uh, in plants, including the generating enzyme um, uh, for CGMP and CAMP. Even though the cyclic nucleotides, CAMP and CGMP, uh, have since the 1950s or 1960s been shown to affect many plant processes, including, um, let me see, uh, stomatal opening, iron homeostasis, pollen tube orientation, and so on. So if they play such an important role in plants, the, the generating enzymes and, of course, the degrading enzyme must exist. Um, so uh, Chris, our uh, former boss, and, and, and other groups took this initiative to try to identify these uh, missing uh, enzymes in plants. Um, <clears throat> so, well, using the same approach, the, the, uh, uh, the motif, um, Chris, myself, Lara, and other colleagues globally have identified many um, novel cyclic nucleotide generating enzymes in plants that are, you know, surprisingly disguised as moonlighting sites within multi-domain complex proteins that have very different domain architectures. As you can see from this 2D of domain organization here on this slide, you know, these are all um, experimentally validated ACs or GCs and uh, that have been published. And um, we have worked on we have worked on those indicated in red arrows. So there are now more than 30 ACs and GCs identified in plants through this motif approach. And our group at Winslow Kane was able to use this rich data to build a reliable um, prediction tool for um, this generating enzymes of cyclic nucleotides. We have actually, uh, we have also built one for uh, AC. Now, um, I, I, I like to tell this uh, story on cyclic nucleotides because I think it's uh, very interesting. And I use that for, for my uh, classes as well. You know, um, we have been identifying new generating enzymes for cyclic nucleotides for many years. But um, it is only recently that they become really popular and well accepted. Thanks to Jiri Fremont's group in Austria. Uh, Jiri Fremont, uh, it's um, one of the biggest names in auxin receptor. So his group used our motif, our AC motif, to successfully identify uh, a functional AC uh, that's hidden within the well-characterized tier 1 AFB family of auxin receptors. Um, they published this discovery in Nature in 2022. Um, yeah, like I said, this story is very exciting to the plant science community because it, we know that auxin is the first and one of the most well understood hormone in plants. And auxin perception through ter one AFB family of receptors and the entire pathway leading to a change in uh, auxin dependent gene transcription has been well elucidated and remained unchanged for about 15 years already. So the discovery of such an important uh, enzyme Moonlighting within the classic auxin receptors um, sort of surprise everyone. So, um, you know, the motivation uh, of Jerry Fremont's group was to um, initially to find um, an alternative mechanism for auxin fencing. They did not deliberately look for auxin within the receptor, but um, they were actually looking for an alternative mechanism for uh, auxin, uh, auxin sensing that could be rapid and reversible. Um, back in, uh, so, so this rapid root response was uh, able to be tracked um, thanks to Heiko Tori 
uh, who invented uh, a device called wood chip. This device is coupled with uh, a confocal microscope and enable real-time monitoring of uh, Arabidopsis root growth. So Jiri Fremo's group used that device and found that when the roots of Arabidopsis was exposed to auxin, the root responded, the growth uh, response of the root took effect within 30 seconds of the exposure. So this is way too fast um, for the classical auxin pathway, which involves you know, uh, nuclear transcriptional changes. So there must be an alternative pathway that remain undiscovered that dictates such a rapid auxin response. And that uh, trigger Jerry Fremo group to use this um, AC motive to try search for um, the possibility of an AC um, uh, moonlighting within this receptor that led to the Nature article in 2022. So uh, thanks to this discovery, uh, the generating enzyme for cyclic nucleotide in plants, especially uh, AC, adenylate cyclase, suddenly rose to the limelight and became well accepted across the plant community. And many groups globally uh, jumped on this uh, mission to search for even more ACs. Um, so we were asked to detail our approach um, to identify and characterize these generating enzymes and, uh, and comment on the moonlighting nature of these enzymes. Uh, within the context of plant cell, which is somewhat different from that of the animal or bacterial cell. Uh, we argue that due to a large central vacuo in a plant cell, which could occupy up to maybe 80% of the volume of the plant cell. So we, we, we argue that this the requirement for a precise, dynamic, and spatial temporal regulation of signaling molecules in micro domains of plant cells is perhaps more crucial and necessary for plant responses to biotic or and abiotic stresses compared to animal or bacterial cells, uh, which is um, you know, uh, relatively empty compared to the plant cell, which is very saturated. Now, it is only in 2021 that these generating enzymes, ACs or GCs, have been identified in crop plants, such as tomato, maize, and uh, uhube. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a very important Chinese uh, foods. Uh, in, we call it hongzhao, uh, red dates, loosely translated. You know, before that, uh, all these discoveries was done on model plants, Arabidopsis or maybe Brachypodium. Um, but you know, in China, uh, the progress is very quick. Um, th th we have lots of big agricultural universities who adopt these new uh, discoveries or technologies from abroad and quickly apply it on crop plants. So uh, in 2021, these uh, Chinese scientists, they were the first to actually use our motive and prove that it works. It exists uh, in crop plants and, and not just that they have a key uh, biological function as well. For example, the AC participate in um, uh, uh, ABA uh, dependent resistance to heat stress in maize, um, among other uh, growth and developmental responses. So these present uh, these ACs and GDCs as new targets possibly for future crop improvement or biotechnology. Um, yeah, I happened to visit some of these guys in China and you know it was wonderful to speak about the, our shared interests in this domain and the history and the motivation that led to the artworks in this rather narrow research uh, area. Now that many cyclic nucleotide generating enzymes have been discovered, uh, the degrading enzymes must also exist since cyclic nucleotides, they must be inactivated by phosphodiesterases to return to basal levels. So together with our Polish and Italian colleagues, we identified the first PDEs in monocot and dicot plants in 2021. 
Um, interestingly, one of them, one of the proteins um, is a potassium channel, which contains an active AC, uh, the figure on the bottom right. Uh, this protein contains an active AC uh, at, the, at the end terminal. And the PDE domain is located at the other end, at the C terminal, and in between it's the multi-pass uh, transmembrane. And this multi-domain protein, uh, whose primary function is for ion transport, harbors both the generating and the degrading enzymes. So this raises yeah, the, po the possibility of an efficient and localized self-regulating mechanism provided by just one single protein, which somewhat differ from that of other organisms as they normally exist as standalone proteins. And likewise, uh, we also build a database that gathers all um, plant moonlighting proteins so that we can understand more about how moonlighting sites fine-tune molecular signals in confined microenvironments of plants. Right, now at the moment uh, in our lab, we no longer focus on discovering single ACs or GCs. Well, not because they are no longer important, but because there are already so many being discovered. Rather, we are now more interested in um, studying double or even triple AC, GC, and PDE domains that might exist in the same protein, such as uh, this one. This one is particularly interesting. It has both ACs and GCs and a PDE at the C terminal. And we showed that all three domains are active with um, different catalytic efficiency. Now, um, for today's talk, I selected this part of the research on plant cell signaling to uh, discuss in further detail and um, talk more about the experimental data as it is our more recent work, and at least to me, uh, it's very exciting. So this one is about abscisic acid, and we know that ABA regulates many aspects of plant growth and development, as well as um, plant responses to abiotic and biotic stresses. The most important one is probably the closing of stomata um, to allow plants to respond to drought and heat. Um, we use the same motif-based approach to discover um, new ABA binding proteins in plants. Uh, again, much like auxin, ABA receptors and the entire signaling pathway have already been um, well studied and understood for a long time already. So, uh, well, briefly, the traditional pathway or the canonical pathway is that ABA will act through this uh, PYL, PYR, or, or, or RCA family of proteins. Uh, these are ABA receptors, and the binding of which will cause a uh, change in the conformation that favor interaction of these receptors with the negative regulators, PP2Cs, it's, it's like protein phosphatase, and consequently release the sucrose non fermenting related protein kinase, SNRKs for the phosphorylation of downstream targets that uh, lead to, among other effects, AB, ABA-dependent ion transport and gene transcription. So that's the um, classical pathway for ABA. Um, back in 2017, uh, we showed that ABA could interact with other proteins other than uh, this PYL or PYR or our kind of family of receptors, uh, as, as uh, exemplified by the gut cell outward rectifying channel, uh, or uh, in short, GORC. So um, we showed that um, GORC has ABA dependent conductance and it has a cryptic binding site, which is uh, essential for ABA interaction. And, and we use the same motif-based approach by just including only the key amino acids that is directly involved in the binding with ABA and use this consensus motif to search for more ABA-binding proteins in plants. Uh, in Arabidopsis, we found about 59 to 60 candidates, one of which is GORG. And we previously showed that GORG binds with ABA and has you know, channel conductance that is 
directly modulated by ABA. And a little bit from the animal perspective, you know, um, because ABA is so attached to plants that we forgot, we sometimes forget that ABA is an ancient signaling molecule that is also that also exists in animals and including humans. So interestingly, in the genomes of um, animals and humans, uh, there are three um, three uh, uh, isoforms of um, this uh, land hyaline synthase C-like protein, or LANCL, one, two, and three. And the first two isoforms have been shown to actually act as uh, bona fide ABA receptors. Um, the second one, LANCL2, for instance, is a GPCR. It's a non-transmembrane G protein coupled receptor that's highly expressed in, in, in the brain of mammals. And it's translocated to the nucleus upon binding with ABA. And LANC2 was shown to bind ABA. And the resulting activation of this ABA signaling pathway stimulates metabolic events in granulocytes and uh, insulinoma cells. Both LANC1 and LANC2 could stimulate ABA-induced uptake of glucose by activating the uh, expression of uh, glucose transporters, GLUT4 and GLUT1, among many other components within the ABA signaling pathway. So, um, and ABA exists in animal tissues, but they don't operate. They do not operate through this PYL PYR uh, family of receptors in like those that exist in plants. And in 2023, uh, very recently, uh, Julian Schroeder's group published in uh, PNAS reporting that ABA induces changes in the chromatin accessibility, which are both extensive and persistent. You can see from this, uh, on the right panels, uh, you can see that after um, four and twenty-four hours. The the, the ABA induced changes. Uh, it, it's it's still there. It persists for a long time. And these are uh, and 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 these are uh, examined during uh, ABA dependent stomatal uh, movement. Now, um, since uh, since this uh, SWI SNF complexes are involved in regulating um, DNA replication and repair, um, as well as transcription and the cell cycle. You know, a direct modulation on the chromatin state and gene expression by ABA would enable uh, rapid coordinated responses to environmental signal. You know, it just uh, in, in the same way, we, we, we try to um, challenge or we try to question uh, if if there is a faster way of doing things, um, can ABA directly bind to this chromatin remodeling complexes and then directly uh, uh, cause a rapid change in the um, um, chromatin state? So incidentally, one of the 60 candidates that uh, we identified from our ABA search motive uh, is this SWI3C, which is colored orange on the slide. It's one of uh, it's one component, one major component of the entire SWI SNF chromatin remodeling complex. This SWI3C harbors the same ABA binding site as GOG. So uh, we thought that you know it is con conceivable that this. SWI3C could be directly involved in ABA-dependent plant responses. And here we examine these responses in Newton Arabidopsis plants uh, containing fragments of SWI3C in reverse orientations for RNA-I uh, silencing. So these are RNA-I lines. So this part of the work is done by these this three students um, uh, they are undergraduate. One of them is a graduate student. So um, the two independent Arabidopsis mutant lines, we refer to as SWI3C1 and 2, they have um, impaired stomatal closing and opening responses to ABA. So on the left, 
um, stomatal aperture or uh, cold zero, the wild type plant, decreases from 6 to about 3.5 micrometer when treated with um, ABA. Now, this stomatal aperture of uh, SWI3C1 and 2 average about 5.1 and 4.6 micrometer, which was uh, which are smaller than that of wild type cold zero already. Uh, when ABA is present, the, 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 the stomatal apertures of those two mutant lines are about 4.1 and 3.7 micrometer respectively, showing a significantly impaired stomatal closing. Likewise, uh, on the right panel, uh, ABA inhibition of stomatal opening is less pronounced in the mutant plants, with um, apertures changing from 4.5 to about 3.2 micrometer for SWI3C1, and from 5.9 to about 5 micrometer for SWI3C2. Uh, in comparison, the aperture for cold zero changes from 6.2 to about 3 uh, micrometer. So um, we also look at the ABA effects on the roots of cold zero and the mutant lines. And the ABA dependent primary root growth inhibition is also reduced in the mutant plants with SWI3C2 showing a more severe loss of sensitivity to ABA than uh, the other line SWI3C1. The reduced ABA dependent root growth of uh, this second line SWI3C2 is significant at ABA concentration above 10 micromolar. But for um, SWI3C1, uh, reduced ABA sensitivity, it's significant only uh, at about 100 micrometer or more, uh, mic micromolar or more. Um, both mutants also have uh, fewer, short, uh, fewer and shorter lateral roots, which uh, can be seen from these representative images of planets grown on uh, agar plates. Right, well, we also look at the root hair length and density and they, they were also altered um, in the mutant plants compared to cold zero. It's perhaps not as obvious in this panel of um, images. Right, so uh, we also conducted transcriptomics on the roots and shoots. So this part of the work is done by these two students, Bi uh, Churin and Yu Jia. Um, the ABA-induced root and leaf transcriptomes show marked differences in SWI3C2 with um, gene ontology um, terms that, uh, that are enriched for hormone signaling, uh, metabolism, and regulation as compared to code zero. Um, in the leaf, in this slide, the differentially expressed genes of the wild type, code zero, have a higher proportion of uh, unique upregulated DEGs than those um, shared with SWI3C2, while um, SWI3C2 has much um, higher unique upregulated DEGs. And um, as for the downregulated uh, leaf uh, DEGs, the wild type cold zero also show a higher proportion of unique. Um, than common DEGs, while the mutant plant, SWI3C2, has higher unique down-regulated DEGs. Now, um, in the root, it's more of the same. Um, no, actually, that's a slight different. Uh, so for, for the root, cold zero actually shares more common uh, upregulated DEGs with the mutant plant, SWI3C2, then unique DEGs. But SWI3C2 root has a higher proportion of unique DEGs. And the same is true for the downregulated uh, root DEGs. So uh, taken together, these two slides shows that you know many ABA-dependent gene expression is affected when uh, SWI3C is lacking in plants. We conducted further analysis. Um, so uh, 
Gene ontology enrichment analysis of ABA-induced DEGs reveal higher frequency of terms diagnostic for hormones and signaling function in both leaf and roots of SWI3C2. And this slide uh, only shows the analysis for the leaf. So the green arrows on, on the two panels are terms common in both CO0 and the mutant SWI3C2, but are much highly enriched in, uh, in, 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 in the bubble plots. While the red asterisks next to the terms, or the red stars, they, they are the terms that only appear in only one bubble plot. So we, from here, we can see that um, these terms, um, these hormone-related terms, are uh, the, the, this, these terms have greater enrichments than that of CO0, um, as determined by their rich factors. Um, we also look at the same in uh, analysis in roots. And in this slide, uh, we, we can see that the, uh, there are more terms that are related to hormones in the mutant uh, bubble plot compared to uh, the wild type CO0. And we further analyze the unique and common DEGs. Um, so we first look at the leaf analysis in this slide. Um, analysis of their unique and common DEGs also showed that uh, genes related to hormones um, other than ABA, such as ethylene, salicylic acid, and jasmonic acid are enriched in common and or um, SWI3C2 plants, but not in the EGs unique to CO0. So those terms are, uh, are colored in red in this bar chart. And likewise, for the roots, uh, hormone-related terms also appear more frequently in common and or, or the SWI3C2 plants, but not in the EGs unique to CO0. Um, well, uh, we also surveyed the top 60 DEs based on their full change values. Um, and here we only show, uh, I, I only showed the analysis for the leaf. So um, the top 60 DEGs based on their full change values reveal a greater proportion of hormone related genes in uh, the mutant SWI3C2, the table on the right compared to uh, code zero. Right, um, to test the possibility of uh, direct interaction between this protein and ABA, uh, we evaluated, we first evaluated the model um, generated by Alpha4, and this part of the work was done by these two students, uh, Chiu Wei and Bi Chiu Yin. The ABA motif, which is also present in GORC, is found in, at the swim domain of SWI3C. But interesting, interestingly, it is not present in, um, in its homologs um, SWI3A, B, or D. So it appears to be quite specific to only this isoform. And we also perform molecular docking studies and showed that ABA can dock at w, uh, SWI3C at this uh, domain and forming close interaction with the key amino acids, in particular um, R255, D258, and H272. Um, we constructed our own in-house ELISA assay using the setup here. It is a straightforward indirect um, ELISA. And our ELISA assay confirmed that uh, it will be convenient SWI3C interacts with ABA in a specific um, and concentration-dependent manner. Now, importantly, when we mutate the key amino acid in the motif, um, here, um, um, D258, when we substitute that with alanine, SWI3C ABA interaction is markedly reduced. <clears throat> And we try to justify it from the structural perspective. Um, so the bottom panel is the mutant structure and the green arrows are the distance, intermolecular distance. And we can see that it, um, the docking simulation suggested that in the mutant um, structure, ABA assumed a binding pose and orientation that seems to be more distant 
from the key amino acids at the ABA binding site compared to the amount. Uh, we also conducted another uh, mutant. We generated another mutant, uh, which is H272. And substitution of this H272 with alanine resulted in even lower ABA interaction, almost completely abolishing the binding. And in the same way, uh, structural analysis uh, showed that you know uh, when this uh, residue was mutated, ABA uh, assumed an, uh, a binding post that it's more distant to the uh, key amino acid motif, uh, key amino acids in the motif. So yeah, taken together, our data showed that um, SWI3C is involved in ABA dependent plant responses and could act as an effector of this um, mega multi-protein SWI SNF chromatin remodeling complex that in turn results in a large-scale ABA dependent transcriptional and potentially also heritable uh, epigenetic changes. And there are previous studies on this um, uh, on this complex with uh, hormones. So previously, you know, a, a close homolog SWI3B has already been shown to interact with uh, hypersensitive to ABA1, HEPB1, which is a uh, phosphatase, PB2C. And another component of the SWISNF, the ATPase, BRAWA, has been directly linked to ABA sensing and core signaling pathway. Um, considering that SWI3C, the protein that we currently work on, also interact with DELA to modulate uh, gibberellin responses. So SWI-SNF is therefore emerging as a signaling hub for hormones and or their molecular components. So uh, we believe that by unraveling how this SWI-SNF complex process signals and translate them into dynamic changes of chromatin states will be crucial to review rapid, rapid ABA signaling mechanisms something that can be harnessed for crop improvement. So this work, uh, it's now under uh, revision at Journal of Integrative Plant Biology. It has gone through one round of uh, review. So we hope to strengthen and support the ABA binding uh, with SWI3C through another approach, uh, ITC experiments. And we are also characterizing another uh, mutant line to offer more convincing uh, biological data. So, uh, of course, we are we have also been exploring other ABA binding candidates, which also harbor the same ABA motif. One of which is ASA two, uh, the enzyme that catalyzes the biosynthesis of antranilate, which is an intermediate uh, in the biosynthesis of tryptophan. So um, this student is now pursuing it. And she has just a few days ago, she has, she has uh, showed me her data. And the initial results were quite encouraging. This uh, ASA tool binds with ABA with much, uh, and with much reduced affinity in proteins that harbor mutation to N546. And now we are exploring um, if mutant plants lacking ASA2 have altered ABA dependent phenotypes or biological responses. Right, so well, time passed quickly, but you know, before I end, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce Wonsu King University. Uh, it's a relatively young university. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary this year. Uh, we are located in Wenzhou, China, one of three Sino-American universities along with New York University at Shanghai and Duke University at Kunshan. Um, the, the university currently enrolls about 4,500 students, um, but it is now in, in, in the midst of rapid growth and will bring enrollment up to about 7,000 students within the next three years. And this picture, this is our science building. Um, which is only put into use uh, early this year. So it's brand new. Um, uh, here's the layout of the science building. It's five floors. In the basement, there's an animal house. And at the first floor, it's this large lecture theaters and auditorium. Second floor belongs to environmental science and physics. Third, fourth floors belongs to biology and biotechnology, where our labs are currently at. 
The fifth floor belongs to math and chemistry. So each floor contains both teaching and research labs, core facilities, computer labs, and you know uh, other institutes. At the rooftop, that's my playland. <laughs> uh, there's a greenhouse there uh, that has uh, two highly controlled tissue culture rooms and one sun room for the cultivation of medium to large plants. So at the moment, uh, the utilization rate is low, but we deliberately keep it that way at low density to maintain a high research and teaching quality. So there's generous workspace, facility, and resources here, um, excellent conditions for research. Um, this is some of the images of the interior, the science building. Um, so I'm just going to flash through the, the landmarks and some of the major academic buildings. This is the architecture building overlooking the central lake. Uh, this is the other from the rare end. And this is the business building. This is the library. Uh, we call it a le learning activity center. You know, it doesn't contain much books, but mostly um, space for um, students to, to study. So yeah, lastly, uh, we are uh, recruiting students for our new graduate program, Master of Science in Biotechnology. Our current faculty to student ratio is about one to 20, um, even lower for the graduate programs. So our biotech program is about two to three years, starting from fall every year, but application begins now um, for the intake of for 2025. So here are some of the requirements. You know, the bachelor's degree will need to be certified by a third party, normally US for students from non-US institutions. GPA requirements about three out of a 4.0 scale, but if it's lower, it can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. English test scores, uh, this is uh, quite a relatively low requirement. Um, importantly, the program is new, so there are generous scholarships available, uh, full scholarship. Just to give you an idea, the intake last year, half of the students were given full scholarship um, with 100% tuition waiver and a 2,000 Chinese yuan of living stipend per month. So we normally have small cohorts, about 15 to 20 students per batch. So yeah, do spread the word and encourage uh, students to apply early to stand a better chance of uh, winning the scholarship. So yeah, for inquiries, you can contact the email uh, over there or contact me directly. Uh, so yeah, if you happen to visit China or be nearby, do visit us. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for your time. I think I will stop here.